For the third year and counting, Richard Skipper has been celebrating the artists you love. And what are some of the things that you've really run out of time? And, I, and we've got to talk about your latest. I want to go back a little bit, first of all, and celebrate a true legend. Richard Skipper is all about celebrating life, art, and his guest body of work. And did you pursue performing opportunities while you were in high school? Please join us while he showcases these diverse and talented individuals. Here's Richard Skipper. Happy Tuesday, everyone, and welcome to the latest edition of Richard Skipper Celebrates. Who or what are you celebrating today? There's so much to celebrate if you take the time to do so. Before we start today, two very special people I'd like to celebrate who have a birthday today, Leroy Reams and Charles Bush, two people who are always worth celebrating. I've celebrated Leroy Reams many, many times, uh, but today, Leroy, happy birthday, 80 years young, uh, but who's counting? I, I don't say that. Only because he says so. And Charles Bush, happy birthday. It's also Barbara Eden's birthday. It's Gene Kelly's birthday. There's so many things to celebrate. So let me tell you how today's show came about. And this is an early edition of our show, I know. Uh, but my dear friend, Bruce Spider, who is a producer out on Long Island, uh, his theater company is going to be producing a production of Dames at Sea. Uh, in a few months. So just a few weeks ago, he put, put on Facebook that they're doing Dames at Sea. And shortly after that, he finds out that the Bucks County Playhouse is doing a production of Dames at Sea. And he reached out to me and he said, would you be interested in going out to the Bucks County Playhouse to see this production? And I said, well, let me look it up and see what I can find out about it. Two things sold me before I saw anything else. The fact that it was directed by Randy Skinner, uh, Skinner, who I absolutely love. And the fact that Leslie Margarita was in the show. That's all I have to see and a road trip I will take. So I want to say before I begin, I'm such a fan of hers. And I have to begin by saying, it isn't Jack the Ripper. It isn't Richard Skipper. It's you. It's you. It's you. I am so thrilled that you said yes in the middle of your busy schedule that you would be here today. I saw you play Mona Kent on Broadway brilliantly, Thank you. I might add. And I want to begin, as I do with all of my shows, by asking, besides James at Sea and the great rave reviews that you're once again getting, who or what are you celebrating today? <gasps> Oh my gosh, I feel like lately every day is a celebration. I I, I think let's, I, I'm going to celebrate Randy Skinner today because that was the main reason why I wanted to do this show again. So he, I mean, he is, I think, one of the last great, like, uh, connoisseurs of what he puts together in shows and kind of the old old style tap and his choreography is so amazing. So I'm, I'm going to celebrate him today. I totally agree. Uh, so, Randy, this is for you today. Uh, but I want to ask, how much of you is in Mona Kent? And how much of Mona Kent is in you? I mean, I think that the, the, the bad parts of me are all in Mona. <laughs> <laughs> the parts that I hide are all in Mona. I, it's She's one of my favorite characters to play. And so immediately when Randy asked me to do this, I said, yes, because she is just this monster of a woman. And it's so fun to play because, you know, she's not evil. She's just oblivious and, and just, it's the most fun to be just so full of yourself on, on stage. <laughs> it's all, it's an actor's dream. It's what we all, what people automatically think of us anyway, but to get to be, pretend to be that. On a, on a nightly basis is really, really spectacular. Now, have you seen any other actresses play this role? Well, I did the show in college. I played Ruby at UCLA. So, and I didn't know it before. And my college professor actually picked it for me. And he said, you have to play Ruby. She's, you know, 
I'm the, the most opposite of Ruby now, but then I guess I was a little more Ruby. So I only knew my friend that had played Mona in college. Otherwise, I had never seen it. Um, you know, there's not much. The only thing that I saw before I did Broadway was one of my favorites, Ann Miller, was Mona in a television version in the 70s. Uh, which is so much fun. And Randy we stole a few things from her because how can you not steal from Ann Miller? <laughs> and so we, we stole a few things from her, um, but that was the only, the only version that I had seen. There's really not a lot of archival footage of it. And of course there's the, the album, but no, I, I hadn't really seen it. So it was, it was nice to build her from the ground up, not really knowing much about her. Well, I'm very excited because on Thursday, I will be coming out to see this production. I will be there in the audience. Uh, but, uh, you know, the Bucks County Playhouse is it such has such a great history, number one. Uh, and I know that you did Guys and Dolls there as well, playing Adelaide. Um, can you describe for yourself what it is about this theater and... It's, it's been years since I've done summer stock, but there's something exciting about going away, doing summer stock. In the case of the Bucks County Playhouse, you are in close proximity to New York, but I know that you're probably staying out there. Am I correct? I, we stay out here. I mean, I've, I've had to go back on the days off to do some other work, thankfully. Um, but most of the time we're, we're here because it's a bit of a train, mm -hmm. you know, to get there and, um, and it's so beautiful here that we want to spend our days off just just walking around and our our cast is always together doing things because we, we also try and keep in a little COVID bubble of, of who yeah, we of see and who we don't. So it's it's pretty much the ten of us um, all the time. But I, I've loved this theater since day one when I um, Hunter Foster actually asked me to do Guys and Dolls and I had never worked out here and I had just the best summer because it's run by all of these amazing Broadway people that wanted something cool outside of New York where people didn't have to go to the city to see a Broadway caliber show. And, and you know, not all regional theaters are like that. It's a bit hit or miss. But this one, the productions are always first rate. They take great care of us. And I just, I love it so much. And the theater is so cool. It's a, like a barn, you know, it's just, it's, it's so, um, what you think about summer stock is is what this theater is, and they have such an amazing built-in audience that are they're fantastic. The audience and the reviews great. have been absolute raves. Oh, so, good. I, I don't I don't read them. Well, I'm telling you, they've been raves. <laughs> so uh, I check them out. They're all right. raves. So congratulations <laughs> to everybody involved. When and I know this. Uh, if you if you're lucky enough to revisit a role. Uh, no matter how many times you revisit it, uh, there are different shadings to it. Mm -hmm. uh, there's different casting, there's uh, different people that you're working with and uh, the circumstances. What's different now about this character than it was when you were doing it on Broadway? I mean, it was seven years ago. I, I'm now a little probably closer in age to what Mona would have been, would be. It's it For me, you know, Broadway is, it, it's daunting when you're, there's so much money involved. And so to put up a, a, a new show is very stressful. And, and I think that there are so many people involved and, and giving their opinions on what they think your character should be doing. Luckily, Randy is the exact opposite. Randy lets you go and then kind of hones it, you know, and then we'll chip away at the, the, the stuff that's not working. Um, so I was really excited to come back to this because the, the pressure of, Broadway wasn't on it. Randy got to really do the version that he, Randy is, doesn't come and see shows of his again because he always wants to change something. Mm -hmm. so there were things that he had wanted to change from the Broadway version that he just didn't get to. Um, so he's really doing the version that that he he wanted to uh, here, which is, I, I love. And I, I think I just understand her more now. I'm having more fun with her now definitely and it and it is it's a whole new group of people which is and they're all fantastic and so things that i had gotten from an actor on broadway i, I get something completely different from from one of my castmates here so i always enjoy going back to do a role 
because you really do, you know, regional theater, they're short contracts. We're, we're here for five weeks. And, and sometimes if I haven't played the role before, I just feel like I'm scratching the surface. And Broadway, we ran a few months for Games at Sea, but I really, I wanted to keep digging with her. And so this has been such a gift. And I hope I get to do it more. You know, I, I think I have many more Mona's years in me. <laughs> I think you do. This is wonderful. Now, the word that I chose today for our giveaway, uh, and I'm giving away a Richard Skipper Celebrates mug. And of course, Leslie, you get one complimentary. So thank you, thank you for doing the show today. Uh, but uh, the word I chose is competence. Uh, and I'll tell you why I chose this word today. Um, it's come up uh, a couple of times this week. Uh, someone was uh, posting the other day uh, about how things, and COVID of course has changed a lot in terms of the way that casting directors and everyone are casting shows and everything. You have a very impressive resume. Uh, and uh, years, I call it celebrating your body of worth. Uh, you've built that up. Uh, the competence is there. We all know that. Um, when do you feel that you found your own competence in this business? It took a while. I, I have been doing this since I was a kid. And I remember feeling, as we all do as kids, I was just unstoppable. And, and nobody had told me I didn't have social media. That, was, that wasn't a thing. I wasn't hearing a lot of outside uh, negativity. And then as I got into college and social media started happening and and I started working more um, with, you know, more difficult Hollywood people, you start to question every, your competence <laughs> because mm -hmm. it, you know it's, it's not about your competence. It's about everything else. It is a business. But I really, um, I don't think I came into my own until my late twenties. I, I felt, I always felt not good enough. And, and now I celebrate my differences. I like that my voice is different than other people's. I like that my skill set is, is, is different. But I think when you're, when you're growing up, you want to fit in. And it took me a really, really long time, especially for, for Broadway to kind of find my path. Um, and then once I did, I, I really, I mean, listen, there are days when you, when you don't, the competence you feel is not there, but I really, um, I really started to celebrate that. And it's also, you know, I, I do a, a cabaret show called rule your kingdom and I call myself queen Leslie. And that came out of not feeling competent and feeling like people are always going to put a label on you. So I might as well do that myself. And if it's going to be a, a label, it's going to be a good one. So I always say, call yourself queen, whatever king whatever you want and that it came out of that and and building self-confidence and confidence in my competence um and and mm -hmm. it's, you know a lot of people are like oh she calls herself queen well it's not about that at all it's a it's about ruling your own little kingdom of of you and and making sure that you are confident in yourself. And there are many days, many days where I don't feel that, but I think that's just part of being an artist as well, the, the ups and downs. Well, it's difficult enough being in this business uh, when you're constantly being, uh, whether you want it or not, it's there uh, compared to others, uh, that it, it's, it's constant, uh, that rat race that's going on. Uh, and then there is that extra layer of social media that adds that horrible, uh, someone, I'm not gonna mention the name, posted on Saturday night that he was crushed because someone actually posted, sent him an email or posted it uh, that he couldn't understand why he was getting booked in any venues because he had no voice. Oh and uh, someone took the time to send him this email. <laughs> and that's, that's nothing more than cruelty. Let's just face cool. it. Cool. So, but when you've got, you're trying to navigate the waters of this business, and then you've got this other layer of social media on top of it, how do you navigate those waters? I get in trouble a lot <laughs> with my social media. I, I'm very, very honest um, and will always 
give the theater kids advice, but I'm all, sometimes too too honest, and and sometimes I've had to to rein it in. For me, it's trying to find the good in social media. It is, you know, there are so many people that, like you said, are there just for cruelty. And the hardest thing I think about, especially theater, is people will go see a first preview of something and then immediately jump online and trash it without, you can't have a preview period anymore of changing things or finding what works. So it's, it's, it's dicey. I'm not a huge fan of people recording shows because I think it kills creativity. I think they then, you know, have, I sound so ancient, but I, I used to just listen to the soundtracks and then, and cast albums and imagine what I would have done with a role instead of watching somebody and then copying what they've done. I don't mind if, if someone goes, I can never get to Broadway and see a Broadway show and they want to see a bootleg, that's fine. But if you're using it for creative reasons or copying someone's choreography, that's when I start getting uh, a little angry. And that is part of social media is people posting clips of shows and on TikTok and everything. And I'm, it's, it's- Or taking things out of context. Yes. Well, they, I mean, how many times have I I've seen you know uh, the one crack of mine in a in a in a whole show, and that is just on a loop of just my voice cracking or something. You know, it's it's totally out of context. But it is there's there's a lot of cruelty on there, and and it's difficult. It's difficult navigating. It's difficult because shows need to promote on social media. But then what do you what can you do? What can you say? And so. It's it's difficult, but I I definitely try and use it for good. I know well, that I always say, but that's I try. Good. So I pulled a surprise question, and it's interesting what this question is today, <laughs> based on the co uh, conversation you and I are currently having. But the question is, what is a mistake that people often make about you? I think that I come across. I was just talking about this. I think that I come across very confident and very, you know, Italian and very like, and so I think that people feel that they can say anything to me and I won't be offended. And so I get quite hurtful things said to me sometimes at the stage door because they think that I'll appreciate their, their witty pettiness or something, you know, it's so odd. And so uh, I I'm gonna back up for just a moment. Somebody will say something to you at a stage door yeah. after a performance, right mm -hmm. on the heels of a, yes. that is, uh, it's a whole other level, yeah. Um, so I get that. I think that people think I am have I'm just completely together and so confident and and but things I'm very uh, I take things to heart a lot. So I think that's the biggest misconception <laughs> is that I that I don't care what anyone says about me. That's not true at all. <laughs> well, who do you feel out there knows the real Leslie Margarita? All my family, absolutely my family. I mean, the, I grew up with incredibly supportive parents who there was no other option for me to do this. And I know how lucky I was that they absolutely wanted me to do this. And my family- well, let's go back there for a minute. Now look at this. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's no other way you had to do this. Look at that poof, just, yeah. I, I love to. this. You, I, I mean, the con I mean, talk about confidence. That it's it's all there. Do you know any? Uh, what are your recollections of this photograph? Uh, what I remember about it is that I had a swimming lesson the morning before, and I refused to let my mom dry my hair. And you can tell in the picture it is damp. She, I was just very um, strong-willed at that age, still am. But I remember that that I didn't want to leave my swim class early because I didn't want to have to get ready for this picture, but it was fine. But I do, I, yeah, I remember that very vividly. And I remember performing this number at the county fair. <laughs> uh, now, where did you grow up? Fremont, California, on a cattle ranch. Wow. I know, I'm a country girl. I grew up on this cattle ranch and kind of, my sisters were older. And so I, I was kind of an only child. They were in college and as I was, growing up. So it was just me on the ranch until I was 12. And then, then we moved to what I, what I thought was the glamorous, you know, tract house in a, in a regular <laughs> neighborhood. 
Um, but yeah, I, I loved it. I, I would do shows with the cows and. <laughs> well, you know, there's, a, there's a great line in the uh, 1937 version of A Star is Born uh, where uh, Aunt Maddie uh, says to the grandmother, I saw her um, in, you know, don't get your, get your minds out of the gutters, everyone. Uh, I saw her mooning the cows yesterday, uh, meaning that she's playing to the cows. Yes. Um, and I grew up on a tobacco farm in oh South gosh. Carolina. So I, you know, and I was out in the cornfields putting on shows and I was singing, uh, Oh, what a beautiful morning in the cornfields and doing all those things. Mm -hmm. But there was nothing else I wanted to do. Uh, but for me, and I'm older than you are, I know that, um, but I grew up a product of 60s and 70s television. Um, where did it start for you? Honestly, I my mom put me in dance because I was so hyperactive and she danced. But I will say um, my, my mom and dad would take me to Tahoe all the time. And we would go and see the headliners at Harrah's or at Caesars. And quite often it was people like Anne Margaret or Charo or, you know, just there's people that I didn't know, Johnny Cash, you know, I, and honestly, I would see these women and go, oh no, I, I want to do that. I want to do that. And they were these incredible triple threat, threat women. That and of course, like watching Judy Garland movies and everything. But I remember going to Tahoe and seeing these women, Raquel Welch, like seeing these shows that they would do that just don't exist anymore, which is very sad. But I would, I immediately said, no, that's, that's what I want to do. Um, and then I started doing theater and I just auditioned on a whim. Nobody knew I could sing. And I, I basically had the same voice that I do now, <laughs> just this like loud belt. And I just fell in love with it. I just fell in love with it. But it, a lot of it had to do with, with going to see those kind of, I, I think like those variety shows in the seventies, you know, the, those people were doing in the eighties, these, these giant shows at the casinos and I loved it, loved it. So you go and audition. Uh, what did you, what was the show that you auditioned for? And I'm assuming you nailed it. You got it. Oliver. I did. I did get it. My ballet teacher was choreographing a production of Oliver and I went in and got one of the boys. And then very shortly after that, a friend of mine was auditioning for Annie starring Joanne Worley <laughs> and like 500 girls were there. And I remember my mother going, you're not going to get it. Don't worry about it. These girls have professional pictures and I had nothing. We were on the ranch and, and she said that like a hundred girls would go out and I'd still be inside. And, and then I ended up booking that. And it, it was just, it, that's what just made me love theater. I didn't know who Joanne Worley was, but my mom was like, Oh, <laughs> <You know? laughs> Uh, rubber chickens and all. Yeah. Uh, so you you end up. I mean, obviously, I mean, because your mom was a dancer and everything. Uh, it, it's one thing that you you already mentioned that you were hyperactive and you were dancing and everything, and you aspired to that. But to pursue this really legitimately as a career, uh, when you made your mind up that you were going to actually go after this, what was the parent response? Absolutely. They, I think my parents would have been angry at me had I not tried. That's great to, to hear. Stay. I love that. It, it's, and I realize how rare that is. It was just no question. They absolutely supported me in the ups and downs. And, and I was very, very lucky that they never once said, maybe it's time to do something else. You know, never, ever in my life. Um, yeah, I, I, I think... I think they would have been disappointed. <laughs> now, were you thinking of a nightclub career because of the types of shows that you were seeing in Tahoe? Or were I, you um, thinking, go ahead, I'm sorry. No, I, no, I, I know where you're going. Like, uh, it just didn't exist by the time I was old enough to have these careers. No, I, I always wanted Broadway and, and just kind of got sidetracked. I ended up in Los Angeles and and went to college there. I, I went to school there because I really wanted to do the live shows at Disneyland. <laughs> and I got a job doing singing at Disneyland. And that was, for me, that was it. I had made it. How many um, shows a day? 
Oh gosh, up to eight. Yes. However, and I had worked at a theme park when I was in high school doing shows. It gave me the best work ethic ever because you do your shows, you know how to pace yourself. I, I think like uh, theme parks are fantastic. I think it's great training <laughs> and I loved it. And so, yeah, I, I, I always, when I, when I did my own cabaret show, finally, it's very much in the vein of those shows. I had backup boys and videos and, and puppets and, you know, so it's very much in that vein. Uh, and I paid tribute actually to those women as, as well in, in the show. So I kind of got to do my, my own version, but I wish those shows existed. I, you know, we don't really no, have stars. Them back. Like I mean, I, I'm, I, I, I've got in the back of my mind and it's like a vision. Um, do you know the show Nightclub Confidential? Yes. I, I think that would be a perfect show for you to do. That would be great. Oh, thank I'm gonna take that, that would be great. I, yeah, uh, uh, I think you should really pursue that. I think that's, I see it, I see it there. Um, so how did the move to New York eventually happen for you? It was crazy. I. While I was at UCLA, I booked a television show <laughs> and ended up working much more in television and still doing theater in Los Angeles. But I would I I would audition for shows and then they would fly me out like for the final callbacks of things for Broadway. And I just wasn't booking the the Broadway shows. So after doing TV and, and theater in Los Angeles so long, I got an offer for a workshop of a, of one act of a brand new musical of Zorro, the musical. And it was a whole British team and the Gypsy Kings were writing the music. And I said, well, this is so exciting. I'll never get to do it because it's going to be in Britain. But the director at the time was living in Los Angeles. So I did one act of this, this musical that I fell in love with. And then over the course of three years, did more workshops and raised money. And then finally, I got a call that they were going to go um, do a tour in England. And they asked me to go do it. There was no guarantee of West End. And so I was getting married like three months before my wedding. I left and I did this tour and then ended up uh, the night before my wedding. I got a call saying we're going to the West End and I, I couldn't believe it. So I, I ended up on the West End before New York. It was. And you get an Olivier nomination. I won. I actually Yes, won. you won. Yes. Crazy. Yes. I know. It was crazy. Uh, uh, it was the best experience. And But I will say this. Even after I thought I would have this Olivier in my hand and go to New York and go, okay, <laughs> what are we doing? <laughs> doesn't happen that way. I still Leslie, welcome to show business. But the Matilda people, so this is how I, New York came out. The Matilda people had seen me in Zorro and were very aware of me. And the, and the choreographer um, had said he wanted to work with me. Blah, blah, blah. So Matilda opened on the West End and so many of my friends from London said, there's a role that you have to play. And I, again, just heard the um, cast recording and fell in love with the, the genius of the show, but then especially my role. And I remember telling a friend of mine, I walked into her office and I said, I'm getting this role. I am getting this role. <laughs> and I flew myself out four or five times over the course of nine months and auditioned in LA as well. And then, so it was really the Brits who gave me the my Broadway uh, shot. And so I moved for Matilda. I had never lived be there before. And and um, ended up loving it, but I, yeah, it was it was an incredible experience to finally get to do that after so many years of. I, I think I appreciate it more because I was older, <laughs> versus you know these young kids who get their first show right out of college. I think I really appreciated it more, and I just remember just bawling backstage at the first preview, going, "I can't! It's happening! It's happening! It's happening!" Well, I'm going to ask you, do you, and I've asked a lot of other entertainers the same question. Do you believe in manifestation? Oh, completely. And while I was auditioning for Matilda, I had a, a, a board, a cork board next to my bed with the Mine's woman. Over there. <laughs> it, it, yes. it was, and I still have it in Los Angeles. It was the woman who was the original Mrs. Wormwood in London. 
except I put, it was a picture of her, but I put a, a push pin through her face. <laughs> so, it, so I didn't have the of her. So I could picture my face. And I had that up for, for nine months. And I absolutely, absolutely believe in, in all of that, in intention and manifestation. And what was your inspiration for that character of Miss Wormwood? I mean, what was the flexibility that you had in terms of creating her? We had complete flexibility. They did not want a copy of London. My dance number was was created for me. They didn't want us to go looking for clips online. And the, the great thing about Matthew Warch as the director is that he wanted for Mr. and Mrs. Wormwood, he wanted dramatic actors. And up until I got to New York, I had done a lot of dramatic theater roles. And so he wanted that so that they weren't caricatures because he found that if if you just got people making faces and and weren't grounded it was it was too much mm -hmm. um and gabe ebert who played my husband is genius and he's this incredible actor so we really got to build it from the ground up and i mean i took inspiration from a lot of uh mike lee films <laughs> from um pa i mean patsy and ab fab was definitely <laughs> <laughs> an inspiration for me yeah. with that hair and everything. So I kind of took it from from everywhere. Um I loved her. I I I found I always like playing the the so-called villains because I think I like to find the humanity in them. And that's much more interesting to me. I, I really want to make the audience like these villains. It's kind of my goal that you want to root for them a bit. <laughs> Well, I mean, I, the last thing that I saw you do uh, was Chasing Rainbows at the oh. Playhouse. And, uh, you know, and talk, I mean, if you, uh, well, I, I'm trying to get the right words for this uh, because I want to be respectful. Um, in Ethel Gum is considered a villain by some people, mm -hmm. uh, but she was a very driven character. Um, and you very much found the humanity in her. Um, when you were approached to do, well, no, you seriously, when you were approached to do her, um, what was your approach and your research in terms of playing this woman who has such a rich history that some people have a preconceived idea of who and what she's all about? Yeah, I, you know, I, I didn't really know much about her, um, or her husband and that kind of story. Uh, it was really difficult to find a way to like her. I, 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 the whole process, even the show, I just felt heavy. Like she was so hard on her daughter. But so the, the weird thing is I went and researched a lot of these momagers, even like Chris Kardashian and what that mindset is and what, I mean, it's, it's, she, you know, uh, <laughs> Judy Garland's mother was M Mama Rose, just not as charming. <laughs> and and but, you know, the other thing, if I may interject here, it, it, and it wasn't just the relationship between her children, it was what she was dealing with with her husband as well. Uh, yeah. And it, and it really was heartbreaking, I think, for her to be in this marriage that this loveless marriage and her husband is so miserable and and all of your dreams for yourself <laughs> die. So you have no point, you have no choice but to put them all on your daughters. If I wasn't going to become famous, I'm going to do this and, and put this all on my daughters. And I just think, I think she was fascinating. I was, it was very difficult to play her and, and not have anyone hate her because they're really were no comedic moments in her life for her in this in this stage version so it was difficult and and we really worked hard to try and find more humanity in her mm -hmm. um i think in previous incarnations she had just been pretty cold and and because there isn't a lot written about her but um yeah that was a that's a tough one it's a beautiful story but you 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 know this woman is pushing drugs on her 12 year old daughter to pep her up. And it's just, it's so hard to find, you know, a mean mother in Matilda's it's funny because she's so 
over the top and 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 but to play these actual women who really had a hand in what then became the legacy of Judy and Liza it just was it was uh, I, I was happy when that was done to take that one off I just didn't and Max von Essen who played my husband who's who's a yeah. genius in it it was really hard for both of us we just didn't like these these people and and being in their skin just felt ugh. um but I, I I'm very glad that you, that you enjoyed it because I think I think Max and I ended up doing what we could with it and 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 mm -hmm. and kind of met our goals that way well, you know, I saw an interview with Sarah Paulson uh, after she, uh, you know, played Linda Tripp, uh, and she said that she had to find the humanity. She had to find some reason uh, within her to even play this character because she hated her so much going into this and everything she read about her. Uh, you just have to find that. Doing a role like, like any type of role that's a, a villain or uh, an over-the-top What's your process for decompressing after the performance is over? I'm pretty okay. Chasing Rainbows was tough, but I'm pretty great at leaving it at the theater. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, you know, there's only been a handful of times that I still was like, oh, I don't, I don't, I don't want to go back and, and play that person again. But I'm, I'm pretty great at, at leaving it. I think. Um, I am so different than most of the characters that I that I play uh, that it's easy to kind of snap back to me. But I'm not in any way method or um, or get so deep into something. I, I I often find that sometimes that's for me at least. I, I don't give a good rounded performance if I'm too like hooked into one aspect of the character. So. I'm I'm always in there somewhere. <laughs> now, someone asked, um, "Did you do Man of La Mancha with Davis Gaines?" Yes. Okay, Davis Gaines. Uh, when I had him on the show, uh, said something to me that uh, it's very profound that I uh, quote a lot. And he said, "Going into this business, uh, you go in with your with these lofty goals and plans, and then it's almost as if you're in the midst of a pinball machine. Uh, all of a sudden, you're bandied about." And it's all about uh, the circumstances, the people that you meet. And of course, in the midst of all of that, we've had this huge monkey wrench thrown in our, in the midst of everything in the last couple of years uh, with COVID. Um, did you have a game plan in terms of your career? Um, and uh, in terms of the team, the people that you surround yourself with and that you work with, how do you navigate your career? It is absolutely the people around me that that help me. Um, I did have a game plan, and and it has not reached that yet. But but it is part of what we do. It's re, it's like a GPS re rerouting, rerouting. You 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 have to to go with it. You have no choice because if you, and I've tried like trying to bust my way through some doors, and it just never works. So it just means that's not your door. Um, I love Davis so much. I, th I think oh, I it really too. is. It, and I'm trying to embrace it more of letting go what I thought was going to be my career and just enjoying what it is. And, and, and that's hard as artists to do because you really do go, okay, I'm going to do this by this age and I'm going to work with these people. And it just doesn't happen that way. Some people it does. Some people I'm so in awe of and I, I just wasn't one of those people. Um, but it is surrounding myself with a team of people who know what my goals are and help me achieve them. And if they aren't doing that, then they part ways. You know, I think it's it's so important to find people that believe in you. I've had I've had the same five friends that direct and and music direct my cabaret shows and everything that for over a decade. That that they're people that have your back and. I think it's really important agents too. And yeah, it's just, it's very, very important. And realizing who doesn't serve your life well and how to step back from that, whether that's a, a director or a costumer or, you know, going, ah, not serving me. And, and you just kind of, you know, make a little list of <laughs> people to move away from. <laughs> so what was happening when COVID hit with everything? I was doing Emoji Land off Broadway which 
I talk about it all the time. I love the show. And it had probably the most stacked, amazing cast I've ever been a part of for an off-Broadway show. Um, we were doing that and everything shut down. I um, stayed in New York for a little bit. My husband is in LA. And so I stayed for a little bit. And then when it, when we all realized it wasn't going to be just a couple of weeks, I went back to Los Angeles and, and I ended up, I had to fly fairly early back to New York to finish some TV things. And it was frightening. It was really frightening, but TV got back up on its feet. It was a really difficult time for theater, as we all know. And it, I, I didn't know if it was going to come back. So Dames at Sea, we were supposed to do in summer of 2020. And so this has been a long time coming, this, this Bucks County, but it's, now it's just a different thing. I think I'm still not sure Broadway has completely bounced back. I see it in projects that I'm workshopping. Things take longer to even get greenlit for theater because it's it's still kind of coming back. You know, the, the big shows are doing fine, but a new work, I think it's really difficult to, to launch right now. I don't know about you, but I still feel like I'm walking around in quicksand. Uh, yeah. it, it, yeah. It's hard to plan, you know, far in advance because you feel like you're planning, but it, it's like everything's not moving forward. Uh, <laughs> at least for me personally, that's uh, how I, I'm feeling. Uh, do you have other projects, you know, lined up after Dames at Sea? I do. I I, I do. I go back to LA and um, finish work on a couple of animated projects that I have coming out in the fall. But then I go back and I love television. I, I love the genre. So I'm hoping to go back on a, um, a couple of shows that I recurred on from when I get to do that. But yeah, theater wise, I, I have a show that uh, hopefully uh, if my schedule allows, I really want to do it. I uh, will be in Chicago a year from fall. So like pre-Broadway in Chicago, but it's those things you're like, it's a year from now, which will go so quick, but it takes that long to get things up and running and get the money. And it's just, it's a lot. So yeah, I'm not sure. I, I'm sh hopefully other theater things will, will come up now that regional theater is back. Cause I do love the regional theaters. Well, you've been very, very fortunate because you have been able to bounce back and forth between cabaret work and nightclub work and uh, doing theater. Um, do you, I, and I guess with, the club work, you pretty much are in control of creating your vision of what you desire that to be. Do you have yes. a preference uh, of one over the other or you just love them equally? I love them equally. I do. I, it, it's, it's more nerve wracking when you have control because if somebody doesn't like something in your show, it's because of me. I chose it. <laughs> I wrote it and I, you know, so there is something that's freeing about saying someone else's words and, and some, you know, you, you can put the blame on someone else, but I find that that club acts are really difficult and I'm building a new one now and it's just really difficult and because they're so personal and mine are very different. They're not standard cabaret shows where you to sing a song and go to another song. They're very story driven. They're huge monologues and, and uh, you know, uh, <laughs> video packages that go along with them. And, and that's the kind of show I wanted to build. And so it is, it's a lot of work, but again, like I have, I have incredible people, friends of mine that, that help that vision come to life. But I do, I, I, yeah, it, it, it's, it's, I like them both, but, but it's nice to not have all the pressure of no. doing your whole thing. <laughs> well, we're gonna do some wind down questions. And uh, like I said, uh, use the hashtag word competence uh, and uh, you may win uh, a mug. And I will bring yours personally to you Yay! on that Thursday. Uh, so the first question for you is, who is the most amazing person that you have met in this business that is not in the business? Amazing person that you've not, met in the business. Uh, for example, last night I asked Eddie Corbich this question and he said, Julia Child. So who is the most amazing person that you feel that you've met in this business that's not in the business? Oh gosh. Oh my gosh. I, I mean, I feel like they're all somehow in the business. 
Oh, I don't know. I really like all of my mentors are all in the business. <laughs> I don't know. Outside, I don't know. Oh, pass. Pass on that okay, one. Okay, we'll pass on that. If it pops into your mind, let okay. me know. Um, what is the greatest joy of performing Dames at Sea for you? Oh my gosh. I mean, it opens with me in a gold sequin tuxedo and I get to tap dance by myself doing Randy Skinner choreography with a cane and a top hat. And that is the joy for me. I think the greatest joy doing it though is seeing people have so much fun at the theater. People need to laugh again. And this is just so silly and so fun. And so that brings me joy, making people laugh again as I've really missed that. Well, oh, that's what I cannot wait. Um, I've got a quote. I've got a quote. Um, this is my si uh, simple religion. No need for temples. No need for complicated philosophy. Your own mind, your own heart is the temple. Your philosophy is a simple kindness. That's from the Dalai Lama. How do you decompress? I asked you earlier about decompressing after a show. How do you get away from it all, uh, the business, and shut it down for yourself? It's constantly changes. I do meditate a lot just to get quiet my head because there's a lot going on in my head. Me too, <laughs> um, me too. I, you know, I have hobbies. I, I figure skate. I took up ice dancing again just a few years ago, and that has really helped my head because you're wearing knife boots and you can't think of anything else or you will fall. So it's been this incredible way for me to learn a new skill, relearn a new skill and not think about my career or my business at all. And that's been like such a, a game changer for me is, is having something that has nothing to do with theater. That's just something I'm learning and getting better at. So I'm a big fan of, of telling people to take classes and something that they're interested in. Um, but otherwise, you know, uh, for me, it's, I'm a big star Wars nerd. So a mm. lot of like stuff like that will give me joy and I don't have to think about things, but as far as quieting my head, it's gotta be some, it's gotta be some good old meditation or yoga. It's the only thing, because it's really difficult to shut everything down. And especially like we're saying social media, you go online and it's, you're bombarded with jobs that you didn't get people, cat's out of the bag. I've, I've, I've just booked this job. And you're like, I really wanted that job. It's very difficult to shut it off. I know. I know. I know. You know, it, it's so funny because when I started doing this, uh, and I'll tell you, and this is how I put it in perspective. Maybe this will help you a little bit. But when I first started doing this, an interview with a certain celebrity that I wanted to get or something, um, I would reach out and I wouldn't get it for whatever reason. And then I would see that they would do all these other shows and it would get under my skin. And then I was thinking, you know, there's so much noise out there and there people are doing this podcast and this show yeah. and this show and everything. And I even wanted to say, if you do my show, uh, I would prefer that you not do any other shows for like a week before or after. And then a friend of mine put it in perspective. She said, Richard, if they do your show, they're not going to have the same experience on any other show. It's unique to you. And it's the same thing with any other role. If it was meant to be, it's, it's meant to be. be. And yeah. what you bring to that table is going to be yours when it's your time. And I'm telling you, Nightclub Confidential. Okay. Randy Skinner. I, Randy Skinner. That should be your next project. Okay. I'm going to tell Randy. Manifest it. Manifest it. Manifest it. Uh, at Bucks County Playhouse next summer. I want to be there on opening night. <laughs> yes, <laughs> uh, I think it's 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 great. Uh, has there ever been a time when you allowed your head uh, to override your heart? Oh yeah, yes. I think it happens all the time in this business. I think we make uh, you know financial decisions for for jobs and and things that. It never works out though. You should always go with your heart because I find that things that I chose with my head, I just haven't quite enjoyed. <laughs> and and it really is, it's it's a good lesson. But yeah, absolutely. I think um things have have I've overridden my heart. 
a few times and shouldn't have. Okay. And when do you think that you were the most shocked in your career, either good or bad? <sighs> there have been so many. I think winning that Olivier was a giant shock because I had been told I wasn't winning. Americans don't win. So that I was genuinely shocked by that. I mean, there've been some bad shocks, but <laughs> you know, I, I think they're more disappointments, but I think that, that winning that was a giant shock. That was so unexpected. Okay. Who is the person in this business that you know with the freest spirit? I mean, I, uh, the freest spirit, there, there are many, uh, I, I'm a massive BB Newworth fan and have been lucky enough to, to be on friendly terms with her. And I just love the way that she lives her life. She, wow, I'm a huge fan. I, uh, mm. I just, yeah. I, I think and just, she's not necessarily a free spirit, but it's more just the the way that she lives her life. I, I find myself often thinking, what would BB do? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good way of doing things. Yeah. What yeah. would BB do? Would BB do? <laughs> yeah. She's been incredibly kind to me. And I just, you know, I can't think. I just think the world of her. I've got a good friend here, and I uh, we actually spoke this morning on the phone, uh, Howard Tucker, and I'm going to shout out to him again, because he's, he gave me as a gift uh, a few months ago uh, a daily act of kindness calendar. And I pulled something from this today, and it says, make gratitude a dinner time tradition uh, uh, by sharing one thing each day you're, that you're thankful for. What's something today that you're thankful for? Being here, doing this job, absolutely. I I actually have a a journal that I try and write every day about what I'm what I'm grateful for and things that, you know, again like manifesting things. But I, today I'm incredibly grateful to get to do this show. That's wonderful. For a while it didn't seem like we were gonna ever get to do shows again. <laughs> and another quote: uh, "The smallest act of kindness is worth more than the greatest intention." Cahil Gibran. Uh, an act of kindness that you shared today. That I shared today. Um, I guess, I mean, we're, we're a little bit on our own. So I, I guess it was, um, it still wasn't really kind. It was just the right thing to do was just helping my, one of my apartment mates move some things. <laughs> That's an act of kindness. Was, you know, it's, it's just kind of what, what, of course, you're going to help. So. That's, that's wonderful. Um, and you've already answered this next question. What are you, uh, what are you, what's next for you? You've answered that. Um, uh, other than the show, um, how did you feed your soul this week? Here at Bucks County, they have an, an incredible, you know, the river walk. And so I've been doing that every day. And last time I was here, I had my dog and I don't have him with me this time. And, then, and I know it's terrible. It's just the worst. But so I, I imagine he's with me as I'm taking these, these walks. So I've just been doing that really. Um, just for uh, today, I sat on the playhouse deck and just stared at the river and watched the ducks. And that was that was oh, it's so beautiful there. I cannot well, wait. I'm, I'm looking forward to going to the restaurant. It, I have not, the last time that I was at the theater, I saw Andrew McArdle in MAME. <gasps> and that was before, that was a, two years, I think, before COVID. So that tells you how long it's been since I've been there. So Leslie, it took you and Randy Skinner to get me back there. Yay. So I will be there. So and this, is, this is my last question for you today. Okay. Uh, when have you been most honorable in your career? I, I think, I don't know that there's one specific, I, I, I do feel that I speak up for people a lot. Um, I always say it's my big Italian mouth, but I do feel that when there's, uh, people are being mistreated and, and it happens quite often in our business. Um, I, I, I do try and speak up for someone who maybe doesn't feel that they have that power. So I, I find honor in that, I think, in, in 
helping people stand up for themselves. I love the fact that you do that. That thank you for that. Um, we're gonna give away uh, a Richard Skipper celebrates mug. So I'm gonna go here. We're gonna do this. Thank you all for being here. Don't go anywhere for a moment. Uh, so uh, let's uh, see who our winner is going to be today. Uh, it's my friend Marianne Lapinto, and she deserves it. Do you know Marianne? <laughs> oh, she's out there. She, she's she's there for everybody. So, Marianne, I'll make sure you get it. Uh, Marianne, give me a call. Perhaps you should go out to uh, uh, Bucks County with us on uh, Thursday. Uh, so, anyway, I'm going to remove this. Uh, don't go anywhere for a moment. I'm going to give my final remarks, and then I'm going to give you the final word for today. Um, I want to thank you all for being here once again. I know I can speak for Leslie when I say this. Uh, we don't take it lightly in this business when you show up. So thank you all for being here today. Uh, once again, Leslie is appearing as Mona Kent. She's not appearing as Mona Kent. She is Mona Kent. Uh, and she is at the Bucks County Playhouse through September 11th, I think it is. Yes. Uh, and uh, I, I cannot wait. I'm looking forward to Thursday uh, night. I'm going to be there cheering you on. Uh, I'm the one with the loudest laugh and the loudest applause. So, we love that. <laughs> so get ready. Uh, but anyway, Thursday night, I will be there. I hope you all, if you can, get a chance to get there, uh, see the show. Um, after today's show, please go to my YouTube channel. Leave a comment on this show. Uh, if this is your first time here, I hope it will not be your last. Uh, please subscribe to this channel. My goal is to celebrate artists such as Leslie and their body of worth. I believe that it's all about celebrating. Uh, this is my rule of thumb. When you see a post on social media, you can do three things. You can like it, you can leave a comment, and you can share it. That is if it uplifts the artists that it's about and the people that will see it. If it's not going to do those things, simply delete it, hide it, and stop it in its tracks. Mm -hmm. We're not responsible for what's going on in the world, but we are responsible for how we respond to it and what we put out in the world. So we all are responsible. I always end every show by telling you we want to go out and do something nice for somebody else without expecting anything return. Go to your Facebook friends list and reach out to the first name that pops up and reach out with a phone call. Not an email message, not a text message, not a private inbox message, but a phone call, and let that person know what they mean to you. As my dear friend Sean Moniger always says, we're all in this together, but we're not in the same boat. You never know what someone else is going through right now. And I always say, if you're going to go out in a boat, make sure you bring a skipper along. So <laughs> Leslie, I'm going to leave the screen, uh, and I'm going to give you the final word. I do want to say, however, thank you for all the gifts that you've given the world and that you will continue to give. Uh, just say whatever is on your mind. It could be about what we've talked about today. It could be about something that we didn't talk about that you wish we had, or just any final message that you want to leave everyone with today. Don't worry about how to end the show. As soon as you say goodbye, the final credits will roll. Okay. Thank you. And I'll see you on Thursday night. Thank you. So much pressure. I think today, because I was thinking a lot about it, is if you are struggling with anything, panic attacks, depression, anything, please know that you're not alone because it really feels often like you are when you're in that situation. And uh, reach out, like Richard was saying, just reach out to somebody. Um, and and it's just was thinking about it today because I have um, a great number of people that I reach out to when I'm struggling with something. So please always know you are never alone. Never, 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 never. And uh, that's it. Come see Dave and say, see, you'll have a great time and you'll laugh for two hours. Quick. All right, signing off. Be kind. Rule your kingdom. Goodbye.